What's up, my podcast listeners? This is your host, Rafael Matuszewski, and I'm super excited about today's episode because we're gonna go over an entire tutorial of the deadlift and my whole kind of progression on how to get there. And I do have Misty in the room, so hopefully she doesn't uh, mess things up. And my camera's a little crooked. I'm not too happy about that, so hopefully it stays. But what we're gonna go over is how I coach the deadlift, right Misty? Yeah, so she's excited. Um, how I kind of take someone from day one to deadlifting with a barbell, what cues I give, and kind of go from there. So the first thing I do, um, and this is what typically happens in the clinic setting, I tend to get a lot of people coming in with low back pain while they're deadlifting. So the first thing that I do is an assessment of one, number one, their breathing. So if I were to lay down, hopefully the camera can see me, I'm gonna probably start. <laughs> uh, Misty is super excited about this episode. Right, Mist? <laughs> so if I were to get, she thinks we're going outside, that's why. This might be a problem today, oh yeah. Misty. So anytime I'm on the ground, she thinks we're gonna like wrestle and play. Okay, okay, okay. I might have to uh, adjust. <laughs> All right. Uh, are you are you done, Mist? Hmm? Are you done? Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. Crazy. So before that all happened, um, usually the first thing that I'll do is look after breathing patterns. So if I was laying down, a simple thing that I'll test is one hand on the belly, one hand on the chest. If somebody can get this, where my bottom hand here holding onto my belly can expand and retract, expand and retract without that top hand moving too much, then I know that that individual can brace your core effectively and create that intra-abdominal pressure. And if you wanna learn more about that intra-abdominal pressure, I did another uh, podcast a video uh, like this one, um, maybe three months ago, and it's about 30 minutes long of why that's important. So that's my first assessment. The second assessment is um, to figure out their deadlift uh, depth. Because a lot of people end up deadlifting way too low than they actually can, right? So there's so many other ways to like assess if someone is ready for deadlifting. But one uh, way that I like, and I stole this from Dr. John Russin, is feeling, and you need somebody with you to do this, feeling the moment that your lumbar spine goes into flexion. So an easy one is if I had the dowel, I would set up just like my deadlift position and my dowel is my barbell. I would start sliding down into my deadlift position and then back up while having someone, AKA me, doing the assessment where I would place my four fingers onto my lumbar spine and the moment that I am sliding down and I feel just a little bit of my four fingers spreading apart, that's why I tell them to stop. The reason behind that is that it, to the naked eye, this could look you know, neutral, the spine's good, I have no idea why I get back pain every time I deadlift if I know my spine is flat. But you could have a micro uh, movement of your um, vertebrae going into flexion, and that's how you'll feel with your fingertips if they start moving apart. So then maybe what will happen is, you know, you get that person or yourself going down, they feel it about here, where you usually deadlift down here, right? So that being said, if we know the person can't um, brace their core by creating intra-abdominal pressure, then um, there 
there's no safety belt. And that's what I kind of keep referring to the diaphragmic breath is kind of like the safety net around their lumbar spine when it comes to deadlifting. Okay. Kicking stuff. Um, so that's kind of number one. Number two is that pattern to see if they can actually get there to the depth that they think that they're able to do. Most of the time, it's never where they're at. So if you think about it, um, if someone is deadlifting with a standard Olympic barbell um, weight plates, right now, you know, say when you go down to this depth and you know the distance of one of the plates, how far it is in relation to the floor, that's how much you need to elevate it. So it almost becomes like a rack pull. And a lot of times that's where people should start is like an elevated deadlift. A lot of times people are like, oh, deadlifts, I'm gonna go off the floor, I'm gonna do what that guy's doing and that's it, right? So oh, my camera is like slowly lowering itself. I'm having a terrible time with my equipment today. Um, so that being said, sometimes, when I see that, that lumbar uh, flexion, now I know that every time they place load into the deadlift position, they're getting a lot of load through flexion and that usually irritates the discs, especially if it's loaded. Like there's nothing wrong with, you know, doing this and then back up. There's not, there's not a lot of load to it, but for the most part, if you're a person with low back pain, history, whatever it is, then yeah, maybe you should not go into a forward fold or to pick something off the ground, you're rounding your back, let alone taking a barbell or whatever you have for your deadlift and then going into that hinge and the whole thing collapses. So kind of my thought process is like, okay, if I have somebody coming in with low back pain, they already de they're already deadlifting, I'm gonna check their breathing patterns, I'm gonna check that assessment of the dowel to see actually how far they can go. Usually those two things really suck. So in my head, I'm like, okay, this person needs to learn how to do some kind of core stability, um, basic, you know, core progressions. Cause a lot of times people skip, like I tell people you need to do your bird dogs and dead bugs. And they're like, oh, that's so boring. It's so stupid. But those are the things you need. And most likely when you do those dead bugs and bird dogs, you're just going through the motion and you're not actually, um, you know, creating the tension that you need to contract, to relax, to translate to bigger lifts like the deadlift. Now, how I get people deadlifting pain-free and like never had an issue with low back pain in my life when it comes to my clients is I start them with learning how to breathe, aka what we just tested, and two, how to move their hips in the hinge pattern. And there's a couple ways that I do this. So one, I try to reinforce um, the movement of the deadlift and all these other different exercises when I program. So a good example is just a glute bridge. When you think about it, a glute bridge is a deadlift. You're going through hip extension and hip flexion back and forth. So I reinforce the hinge pattern over and over and over and over again in my client's program. So when it comes to the time to load that pattern, they're, they're ready to go. The other way that I, um, I'll get to that in a second, but the hinge. So a lot of times back to the dowel, I will either get people just going through the hinge to the knees and back up, the knees and back up, just body weight, learning how to do this. Sometimes this is where uh, program comes into play. That might not work for somebody. For some reason, they can't grasp the concept of I'm going to use the dowel and slide it down my legs and back up. And I forgot to mention all my people listening, again, the video will be uh, available in the show notes if you wanna watch this instead of listening it, listening to it, be my guest. If not, I'm gonna be as descriptive as possible. So that being said, things usually don't work out the way you planned as a coach and you have to have a lot of things in your arsenal to throw in and kind of be ready for whatever. So. That's my first kind of point is learning how to slide the dowel down the legs to the knees and back up into the deadlift position. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes I'll take the dowel and place it on my bum with my hands in kind of like a open palm position and I'll squeeze and push into my glutes to get some little lat activation and then go into the hinge. And 
sometimes that tends to work a little bit better. Sometimes it's the reverse. Um, sometimes I do go standard, let's put the dowel against my tailbone, my shoulder blades and head, bottom hand where my low back is, top hand where my neck is, and now I'm going to go into the hinge. All three great options. Sometimes that doesn't work, so I'm going to go back to the dowel um, deadlift where I'm sliding it down, but I'm going to wrap a band in the middle, attach it to a cable, um, a cable machine or some sort of pillar squat rack, and I'm pulling the band towards me so now I got tension and I got to keep this position to slide down and then people kind of get that concept of tension. Now, sometimes that doesn't work. So an easy one is like, I do this with a lot of people, is like with the wall behind me, I go, I want you to push your hips back until you touch the wall and they end up doing this. And they're like, oh, that's what I need to do. Because a lot of times people don't understand the concept of like hinging. They kind of just go into like this weird butt out knee thing until they kind of like slide down the wall in a squat slash hinge and it's super awkward. But uh, most of the time this tends to work. Worst case scenario, I go, all right, imagine yourself running. You're tired and you need to take a break. This position here. So for the people listening, I'm literally just holding my hands on top of my knees in kind of like a resting position if I was running. So this is literally the hinge. So sometimes I get people just sliding into that position and then back up and they learn that hinge pattern. Now the other way that I sneak in that hinge pattern without them knowing is the single leg deadlift um, option. So I literally go into a single leg position. I do the deadlift. I usually do a reach forward to counterbalance and now I'm learning how to hinge one leg, working stability, foot stability. And the other thing that people don't think about it when they deadlift, and there's a reason why I'm barefoot. That's the other thing that we're gonna get into. Is the reason why I'm barefoot is I'm teaching the person how to have a tripod position in their foot. Because a lot of times people make the mistake of like deadlifting and they end up like doing that hinge but so far that they're leaning onto their heels and their toes go up and they're trying to come back that's not the best way to you know activate your glutes and all those lateral hip stabilizers to drive you back up you're going to get primarily all hamstrings and lower back stuff um so when i go and train people highly recommend you go barefoot at least socks wherever you're at so you can feel your heel your big toe and the rest of your toes creating that tripod position so then when you go into that single leg deadlift one on one leg you, you're required a lot more stability so those little intrinsic muscles in the feet have to work that much that much harder it's a lot more difficult to teach that concept of rooting yourself into the ground when you have two feet on the ground whereas if you have one you're like you feel that right away so a lot of it comes down to like just smart programming smart thought processes when it comes to deadlifting and I've had people like patients in the clinic where they're crossfitters they that's all they do is deadlift squat bench kipping pull-ups and shit like that and I take them down to a single leg deadlift and they're all over the place and I'm like you can deadlift like 300 pounds for reps on two legs but you can barely do a single leg deadlift on just your, with your body weight imagine if we were able to get your single leg deadlift to a barbell with like 135, how much your two legged deadlift would go up? And they're just like, mind blown, right? So sometimes it's just you're missing these steps. So now that we've assessed, my first phase is teaching the person how to breathe, teaching them how to hinge properly, sneaking in other hinge like exercises to reinforce it, and then also throwing a lot of stability work that's gonna be needed for the deadlift itself. Now, um, my next phase after all those things is just a progression. So this is where I end up loading um, a deadlift. And usually when I get someone brand new, it's four weeks of just learning those basics. And then that fifth week to week eight is when we're actually loading the pattern. Sometimes people just don't get it right away. I'm gonna do another four weeks at the hinge, but um, most of the time, I will use a dumbbell in a sumo position. So, one, 
I recently switched over to a dumbbell uh, deadlift only because I used to use a kettlebell, but I would always have to elevate it, right? And going back to our assessment, most likely the person does not have the depth to go down to the ground. So when you put a dumbbell upright, it's usually pretty high up elevated, but in this case with the 20, it's a little bit too high. So let's, for the sake of the argument, we're gonna elevate it and I'm gonna use a different colored kettlebell because everything's black here. I'm even wearing all black. Boom, so that's gonna be a lot higher. And of course, Misty's gonna wanna smell this to make sure it's safe for me. Right, Mist? It's safe? Good girl. So I like to teach the sumo deadlift right off the bat. Yes, we just did a lot of hinge work in a more of a conventional stance, but I find it's a little bit easier for people to grasp that hinge in a sumo position. Because a lot of times when we now go into a conventional, they don't have enough hip mobility and they can't get their hips into flexion enough, it becomes awkward and weird in here. So I've now switched all my clients to go into, Misty, come on now, um, into a sumo uh, stance. And now it teaches them to get a little bit more lateral stabilizers going. Misty, stop scratching the floor, come on. <laughs> and from here, like how we taught our, um, our first four weeks, we're gonna push our hips back and we're gonna reach down for that dumbbell. And I always cue that we're gonna squeeze that dumbbell together, or depending if you don't have the hexagon ones, you just have like circled ones, you can squeeze it together this way or this way to get lat engagement. And from there, we're driving up and back down. Couple things here. To kind of reinforce everything that we learned, Say I decided that the hinge with the dowel and the band worked the best for you know this client. I have now taught them how to do lat engagement. So now when we're in this next phase where we're going to get this person to now deadlift, I tell them, just like the band, get those lats together. I always use the cue hide your armpits because a lot of times when people go into a deadlift, this is super loose. But if you tell them to hide their armpits, they get that like armpit squeeze and lat engagement and they're squeezing the crap out of um, the dumbbell. Now, the other thing I snuck in was that tripod foot position when we were doing the single leg deadlift. Now I tell them and reinforce, remember your heel, your big toe and the rest of your toes, your tripod rooted into the ground. The other thing too is when I coach the single leg deadlift, I always tell people like, think of pushing your knee out. Cause a lot of times when people do the single leg dead, deadlift, the knee kind of fumbles everywhere and it's kind of awkward and weird. So I always force people to think like, exaggerate how far your knees go. And now we're just teaching the person how to externally rotate their hip a little bit more to get those um, external rotators fired up, which now can work beautifully in this deadlift. So now I tell people, think of pushing those knees out. And on the way up, push your feet out this way. The moment you push out to the side, you get, again, those lateral stabilizers. And then from the very beginning, we've been teaching for four weeks how to breathe. So at that bottom hinge position, right before you go, deep breath in, you hold, exhale, and you squeeze. And then you come back down. There are a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving parts for this deadlift. But when I start reinforcing all these things, and a lot of times that might not work out and you have to like pivot. And sometimes pivoting means let's not use a dumbbell and let's use a kettlebell. So if I were to grab this 20 kilo kettlebell in an elevated position, now the handle is available and now I can reach down, squeeze the handle, and again, hide the armpits, drive up, and I'm good, right? Sometimes just a different, um, I wouldn't say environment, a different object that has a different feel to the hands could be that trigger that will 
change everything. And sometimes I find that small changes like that go a long way. A lot of times when people start deadlifting in the beginning, it's more so learning the movement, right? And that's why I place a huge emphasis on um, the hip hinge over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So I don't really go that heavy when it comes to like the second phase of my clients programs when they first start. A lot of times it's like, I will literally give them like a 10 kilo kettlebell. I'm not giving them something super heavy, but sometimes that's the approach you want to go with because say I give them, yeah, a 20 pound dumbbell, 10 kilo kettlebell, whatever it is, they know it's not that heavy. So sometimes it's like, oh, I'm just gonna let it go through it and they do some weird shit. But say, brand new client, this is their fifth week, first time with weight, like this is 20 kilos, so this is about 44 pounds, you're gonna go deadlift it and they're like, oh shit, like this is gonna be heavy, so I gotta like really brace it, like. And then it ends up looking beautiful because they know it's heavy, right? It's the same concept of like, I'm like, hey, you know, help me move and pick up this couch. And they're like, oh, fuck, I need to, like, get myself ready to pick up this couch. If I go, oh, can just hand me that box? It's just, like, crap from my drawer. They're just going to pick it up, like, round it back. They don't really care, right? So that's the, one of the other things that I coach to my clients is that no matter what the weight is that you have in front of you when you're deadlifting, think of it as your one rep max. It's going to be as heavy as shit. So when I kind of get that habit of you know thinking that hey this deadlift is super heavy no matter what weight I you know placed in front of them or place on the barbell they're gonna protect that lower back now on the other concept of reinforcing like the hinge um, the thing that we can progress now that single leg deadlift Right, so before I said we just did the single leg deadlift, body weight, now let's add a kettlebell dumbbell on a contralateral load. And I'm gonna bring that up too. I've got that question a lot, it's like, and I've been posting about this. Um, what's the point between, you know, ipsilateral and contralateral loads? And I personally have, have had no success with ipsilateral loading for the general population. Because what happens, so for the people who don't know, if I'm doing a single leg deadlift, my left leg is the one that's gonna be on the ground, my right hand is gonna be holding the dumbbell or kettlebell going through the deadlift, my single leg deadlift. So that is a contralateral load. Ipsilateral will be that same hand, same leg, going into the deadlift. What I see though, all the time, when people grab it from the ipsilateral load, this hip ends up opening up and kind of falling all over the place. And I'm already falling, trying to show the case that. So I just don't find any like purpose for adding that in because I just haven't had success with it. And a lot of times it comes down to hip mobility and hip stability that most general population people don't have. If I had a, but I've had success in the past where I've had people training with me like four or five days a week and we get to that point where they can do that. But most of the time, it just doesn't work out the way I want it to, right? So a contralateral load tends to work a little bit better. Um, so that's where I kind of go with choosing between those two. Um, so, and now with like the glute bridge, um, you can go to hip thrusts, we can go to feet elevated glute bridge, we can go to a single leg version just to reinforce that hinge pattern over and over and over again so that it's down packed. Um, the next phase, if everything went right, and again, like this can get better um, where people can either go heavier or they can go um, a little bit lower too. So you can, this is the other thing too, is if you can retest Misty, hey, Enough with the scratching, come on. I'm making a video right now. Sorry guys. Um, so sometimes you can retest. You can go back to the dial and be like, hey, let's see if you've improved. And that's another way to see as a coach if you um, are doing what's needed in order for your client to succeed. A lot of times 
coaches just go in, you know, blinded and they're hoping that everything's going to work out. But this is where test, retest, test, retest works really well. Um, so say everything went well, we're now month three. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go into a trap bar deadlift. Unfortunately, I don't have a trap bar deadlift with me. It would have been, it would be sweet to have one, but pretty sure my neighbors downstairs are not going to like that while I'm smashing it down. Um, with the trap bar, I find it so easy for someone to understand how to lift it properly. A lot of times, um, when I get to that point, I don't even coach it. I just tell people, you're going to step inside the trap bar. You're going to reach down and grab the handles. All rules still apply. And this is another thing to note. I went from sumo, now I'm going back to conventional. Is that super important? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I, this is what I do. This works great. I've never had anyone have an issue going into that uh, position from we started at conventional stance for learning the hinge, going to a sumo stance in the next phase, and now going back to the conventional. I've never had an issue with it, so I'm gonna keep going. You know, don't fix what's not broken. Um, so you step in, reach down, squeeze the handles, all the same rules apply. Tripod position with the feet, push the feet out and the knees out as you come up. Deep breath in, hold for the intra-abdominal pressure. You're squeezing, hiding your armpit, and then you're driving up, boom. Works every time. I don't even have to coach, I just tell them, remember everything I told you about deadlifting, apply to this thing lift up and lift down. And I just, I think because it allows, you know, a little bit more knee flexion, people are, feel comfortable in that position to drive up every single rep compared to like, let's grab a barbell and now I'll let you figure that out. With the trap bar, it gives people a lot of confidence too. And no matter what client I've had, if it's, you know, former athlete to mom of three never worked out in their life and now i'm gonna get you trap bar deadlifting everyone does a really really good job there's been times where it just doesn't work out and i just have to I'm like okay let's go back to the dumbbell let's try the barbell like sometimes shit doesn't work out but that's that third kind of progression that i'll get people into is that trap bar deadlift now fourth we uh fourth phase so month four now I'm getting clients to barbell deadlift, whether it's um, conventional stance or sumo, that's, it's up to them because anatomy plays a huge role. If I have someone super tall, I'm gonna get them in the sumo position. If I have someone really, really short, probably conventional. If I have someone really, really short and they have terrible hips, sumo, they look like a power lifter, they look badass, they can lift a lot, right? Um, when I get to that point, or we're barbell deadlifting, I'm going to retest if they can get a little bit further down. If that's the case, we're gonna be off the ground. A lot of times, if my programming hits all those weak links that I found in their assessment, I just showcased one bit of my assessment, which is the dowel, there's so many other things that I'm gonna be testing to work on in their program. So as their deadlift is progressing, when it comes to movement competency and all the requirements to get there, there are other stuff in their program that's addressing all their other weaknesses are going up too. So sometimes it's like, I won't even do that dowel um, dental system because I know what I program has been working over the years. So let's just go from with, you know, my best judgment, we're deadlifting off the floor now. We don't have to, you know, worry about elevating it. So if that's the case now, I'm gonna add a little bit more to the kind of deadlift checklist. And the last thing I get people to do, because the neck, I, I still give that cue, but a lot of times people's necks, when they deadlift and that hinge, they like to look at themselves in the mirror and then go up and they just end up doing this like weird thing with their neck constantly. They're always looking at themselves. I'm not a fan of keeping that neck in that position. Because a lot of times, a lot of times, when people do that, the neck tends to, actually the other way around, when the neck goes into these positions, the lumbar spine likes to copy it. So an example is that if I'm sitting here, 
my lumbar spine is going to do the same thing. If I'm looking up, a lot of times my lumbar spine is going to do the same thing. So now I'm just going into more extension of my lumbar spine when I deadlift, and I don't want that. So I teach the pec neck. I always tell people, like, think of you driving in your car, but you're pushing your head into the car seat. Right? Like the little headrest, and that's a good pec neck. Holding that position, now your spine is one unit, one length, and it's going to be stable. It's going to be strong. And now, on your way up as you deadlift, I want your tongue to push to the roof of your mouth as hard as possible. And the reason it's almost like a developmental neuromuscular like inhibition to move. So when babies develop, the way for them to start moving their head is they use their tongue to direct where they're going to look. And then eventually when they decide to roll over, the tongue drives that movement. So it's almost like a way to reset our nervous system of like, hey, I have this weight and I want to go up. So tongue to the roof of the mouth. It's a old power lifting um, cue. Who knows if it works? I do it. It tends to work a lot. Like when I deadlifted 300 pounds for the first time, that's what I did. Like, who knows? It might be just a, like some sort of wise tale, whatever it is, right? But those are the cues that I use. So following this progression of everything that we did, is what I do with every new client. Even a client that is a CrossFitter that's been doing it forever, but they're super injured. This is the progress we go through. And not once did any of my clients have had back pain deadlifting. This is like the surefire way to do it as a progression standpoint. Now there's other stuff that I add into the programming to make sure that they don't injure themselves. Cause we haven't even hammered like hip stability, core stability, you know, shoulder stability, shoulder mobility, like all the other things that play a huge role in the deadlift. We haven't even covered that, but this is the progression that I follow along with all that other stuff. And I've never, ever, ever, ever had a client with low back pain deadlifting. And we get to max lifts. Like I just believe that everyone should be able to deadlift heavy. They should lift heavy and not feel pain unless they're being stupid and not following their volume, right? So I'm gonna end it there because we, talked a lot the dog's dead asleep she probably wants to go outside and uh hopefully this was helpful for all those who were just listening um hit the show notes the video link will be there all the people watching subscribe to my channel i'll be posting a lot more of these um if you're listening give me a five-star review on itunes and Stitcher Radio, Spotify, wherever you're listening to bump up my podcast so more people can get some good information about fitness and health. That's it from you guys. Thank you and until next time.